Our guest for this episode quit his job at the World Bank to start his own business. I know you ask yourself, na hii uchumi, mtu anachaje kazi? World Bank. But guess what? He has his own bank. We raised 500,000 in dollars. And then we used that and we built wire from 500,000 to what it is at 18 and a half million today. Dr. David Washida is good vibes, brilliance, selflessness and a lot of good things rolled into one. And when you listen to him, you get to understand why he deserves all the accolades. There's nothing wrong with renting if rents are affordable. Uh, but the way that at least it has worked in some systems is that, you know, when you talk about wealth, we're not talking about cash. Dr. David Washida is a public finance and economics specialist and entrepreneur who wears many hats and has touched many hats. Hey, what now? Wears many hats and has touched many hats. Where is my ground? You Sir. can swipe a V8. Yeah. How do you sleep with your pocket and you know you can swipe a V8? How do you deal with that human side yeah. of money whispering bad things to you? It's like a demon that you always have to, you know, I choke every day. In my first meeting with Dr. Washida, he detailed the house ownership journey so well that I wouldn't forgive myself if we did not share this conversation with you. I've, I've bought four properties that way um, in terms of just using the equity on the previous house. So now, you don't have to pay up any of them. You just need to build equi equity on any of yeah. them and then use that as a down payment yeah. to buy another house. Yeah. You use money to make money. A graduate of the University of North Texas, Dr. David Washira has managed and supported multi-billion dollar programs across 38 countries in Europe, Africa and Asia. David has also gathered valuable experience in private and public finance, banking, investment, financial management, tax and revenue administration, urban governance and service delivery. It's an honor to sit down with a brother making both moves like Dr. David Washida and it's willing to share with the rest of the world how it's done. Sorry, let me take that again. It's an honor to sit down with this genius of Money Matters for a conversation that I hope will impact your life in the right way. Before we dive into the video, please allow me to give a special shout out to Wojo, uh, where this conversation is taking place. Wojo is a premium co-working space located in Upper Hill in Nairobi. I'll tell you more about them before the end of this video. We'll also share a link in the description on how to get in touch with Wojo. I'm Dr. Kingori and here's a reason to stay subscribed to our channel. If you're not subscribed, here's a reason to hit the subscribe button and turn the notification bells on. I was very, very, very excited that you could explain the wealth creation process. But before we get to that, I'm very uh, pleased if you can just take, take us through uh, why you told me that the first house is the most difficult to buy. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, my first house, uh, which I bought in 2013, was the yes. most difficult because it required a significant amount of savings. So my first house, I had to I'm almost borrow from everyone. Uh, so my mom uh, and my dad gave me a big chunk. I wouldn't have been able to do the down payment without it. Uh, I had a close friend who also facilitated the transaction by loaning me money to be able yes. to do it uh, because I needed, at the time in the, East, in the US, I needed to put about 10% of the down payment. Okay. Uh, and this was in Washington, DC. So um, it was very, very difficult. So I almost you know, exhausted my whole entire savings. And uh, so in, in, when you're buying a house, a mortgage house in the US, what they do is that you do the down payment. It's anywhere between 10 and 20%. Uh, and then you have to show them uh, reserves, which is that you can pay for the house. And so they will ask you, depending on how they feel about you, six to 12 months of reserves. You have to show them like that this you is the have mortgage. Yeah, enough be money back to in, pay in cash. Yeah. For the next one, you have to show them your, of course, your employment and all this, you know, everything. And your debt to income ratio uh, cannot be at the time more than 38 percent. So it means that. Um, using an example of a thousand shillings huh? if your total income is a thousand shillings your debt to income ratio that's the stuff that you're you know paying stuff with cannot be more than 38 percent of that so your house your rent any credit cards cannot be more than 380 shillings out of a thousand so i was right there on the margin huh? so yeah, this yeah. is where i needed my uh, parents to 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 supplement so then when i got that the next house became much much easier because you buy the next house with the wealth that you generated from the, from first, the house, first house, which we call equity. But yes. yeah. before you get to equity, the fact that you need to ask for Ama to borrow money from your parents, your friends, to put it together, uh, yes, you made that. Uh, does the fact that one cannot afford the down payment 
mean that you cannot afford the house? What's the difference? No, not necessarily, huh? because uh, uh, the, the down payments are usually set by whoever the, the, the mortgager is, huh? so the banker. And uh, so in, in, in the U.S. and more or less in Kenya, uh, the down payment is always a percent of, of, uh, of what you need. And the reason why is because no bank will give you 100% of their loan because then by virtue, they would be underwater if something were to happen huh? because market forces play and everything else. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. bank wants to protect his asset and it protects its asset by saying, okay, your house is worth this much. We can only finance it up to 80%. The difference you bring in cash. Ili mm ikiumana -hmm. and the bank wants to repossess your house. They're easily able to foreclose and get the money that they put in. But to your question, um, buying a car, or buying a computer from borrowed money is not a good idea because it's a depreciating asset, what they call it. Buying an appreciating asset like a house, particularly one that is well vested and in a place, you're not just buying because people are buying, you've actually thought out and you've looked at the economics and the dynamics of it. Uh, then, you know, using all these resources to get into it is not a bad idea. The reason being is because you're parking that money in that house. So I was able to pay my mom back uh, very quickly using the equity of that house. So I got a bank from the loan. My mom, as well, while loaning me money as well, I got the bank from the loan. Uh, I got the loan from the bank, then I got the loan from my parents. Uh, and the first people I paid off was, you know, the bank with the mortgage with my mom. Uh, the moment I needed to buy my other house, I took equity from the first house, and then you know, I paid my mom back the, the twenty thousand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does the vice versa work? Like, yes, you borrowed money from your mom. But if your mom borrows your money, uh, does she pay back? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he usually, ah. usually, what happens, at least at, you know, with different different families, huh? So when you borrow money from family, um, and at least our family, the dynamics are usually you borrow from the one with the most capacity, not necessarily oh. the most wealth, but the most capacity, and usually yeah. capacity translates to to, yeah. to more wealth, uh, and that capacity changes at different dynamics. Okay, okay. so. At that dynamic, my mom and my dad were the ones with the most capacity based on their income and the work that they were doing. Yeah. But then remember, I had just finished my PhD. My parents had invested all these resources into me. Very quickly, I became the one with the higher capacity. So I've been in situations where my parents have been the one to come and you know uh, ask for resources. And then at least in my family, there are some that it's just a, a gift and, and you give, yeah. and then there are others yeah. that it's yeah. like, okay, you know, because my mom, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. my dad. Mm. You know, they have put me to a school. They have, I've seen the effort and they were not asking to be paid back. So if my mom says, dena dena or nikona yes, yes, apa, yes, like yes, I'm not yes. going to be like, okay, let's cross out a loan payment. <laughs> you know? See, what level is this here, Petha, that money stops being called money in eight resources? Let me borrow resources. In answer, as in, unajua, uh, 2,000 shillings yeah. your resources. Yeah. 2,000 shillings is... Yeah. That, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'll put it in perspective. Uh, so two weeks ago, I needed to make a transaction yeah. and I didn't have the cash. I, I, and by that, it doesn't mean that I didn't have the capacity to buy. I had the capacity, but I was not liquid in that my cash There's was... A difference? Yes, yeah. Between capacity yeah. Yeah. and liquidity. Yeah. So, so the liquidity is... So the, if you think of a continuum, the liquidity, the most liquid uh, is cash, you know, pure cash. And after that, you know, checking savings accounts because you can easily, you know, convert them. Stocks, bonds, okay, all the way to that particular end, that thing like real estate, okay? Yes, uh, yes. Which means it's not very liquid. Huh? It, you can convert it to liquid, but you can't do it as fast as you can withdraw your, your checking account. Mm -hmm. So I saw a good deal. I really wanted it. Uh, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm not liquid, but this is too good of a deal. It was on Gigi, actually, you know, yeah, in, yeah. In, in Kenya. And so um, it's good to have friends. Like, you call up my friends. I was like, hey. Uh, Renzo, what are you doing? It's like, uh, he goes, oh, I'm, you know, I'm driving my, my, my wife uh, home. We just came from my son's birthday party. And I said, well, you know, give me a call when you get home. I, I need to uh, uh, talk to you about some cash. He goes, you need some money? I was like, yeah. He goes, okay, I'll give you a call. So he took a very long time to call me. And then uh, he eventually called me. And, uh, and uh, he goes, I asked, what took you so long? I was like, well, I was moving around money. I didn't know how much you would need. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah. I asked him, how much do you think I would need? He goes, yeah. 100,000. I'm like, yeah. no, 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 I only needed like 10, 12,000, uh, you know, and uh, dollars, by the way. And so, aye, 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 aye. <laughs> so the look. Uh, ooh, um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. 
ten thousand. Yeah. Twelve thousand dollars. Yeah. They thought it's a hundred thousand dollars. While our Jewy uh, exchanged it say that's almost ten a hundred thousand dollars we are playing around seventeen yeah. twenty million. Yeah. Your friend thought you wanna just borrow that. Yeah. Before we, go, <laughs> before we get there, you, 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 let's go back to the first house. You name dropped something that came up in our last conversation, mm -hmm. equity. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, when you say default on payment on a mortgage, they repossess your whole house. This concept of equity does not exist in our market. Why is that and what does it mean? Good question. Um, actually, even in the U.S., if they repossess your house, um, they will not send you back money unless um, you know there was significant aspect to it. Because when you default on the house, then whoever gave you the mortgage has the right to take the whole asset, regardless yeah. of how much you you had. So you could have borrowed a million and you only own or ten thousand, and then you default on that. They will take the whole entire thing, not counting your. They will not give you yeah. back your equity. Yeah, yeah. Some banks, of course, are humanistic, and you may talk. You may talk to them, especially if you if you if uh, they can let you dispose of the asset, mm -hmm. so that way you keep you yes. keep the stuff. But so what equity is uh, by definition is it's a, an increasing value in an asset. Uh, you know, from you making a payment. So a house is a very good one. So I buy a house for a million dollars. Okay. Uh, it appreciates in two ways. The first one is the market regular appreciation. So, you know, average houses in the U.S. appreciate anywhere between 3 or 5% on average. Okay. Uh, some may go much higher if it's an area that's, that's growing. Huh? Mm -hmm. So if you bought in a place, for example, uh, if you're buying in Machacos right now, uh, you know, over past Imefica, your appreciation is a little bit higher than probably it was 10 years ago huh? because of the access to the road, the new infrastructure bills. So those things, you know, make a house or a property appreciate. Now, if I bought the place for a million, a million dollars, for example, um, and it's appreciating at 3 to 5%, I three personally- 3 to 5%, yeah, so that's I, standard. That's standard, yeah. But I don't buy property that's appreciating at 3 to 5%, uh, because why? At least for me, you know, people can have different aspects. That's the average rate of inflation. So essentially, there's no appreciation. So in the US, uh, inflation is two to three percent. You're hearing all this. Let's bring inflation down because at, during COVID it was nine percent. Now um, uh, last week or last month it was at three point two percent. So if your house is appreciating at three point two percent and inflation is at three point two percent, in fact you're losing money there. Yes, point two yes. percent in the yes. aspect of it. Huh? Yes. So I mean, not necessarily losing money, but you're not gaining. You you essentially that million that you that you bought it for tomorrow is a million thirty. Uh, so essentially, it's, you know, uh, it hasn't much appreciated. So what I do personally, this is my, my personal uh, aspect, is that I look for places, not necessarily where everybody is going, but places that are within the realm of, uh, of, of, of growth. So within you, the realm of growth. Yeah. So okay. you, you look, you have to do research. Huh? You don't just go buy in Raqqa naked or do everybody's buying in Raqqa. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, that's not a reason why. You're like, okay. Pull out a map of Nairobi or pull out a map of where it is and then start start to look. As a, as a rational person, you can see growth. It's random growth. Oh, yeah, up, 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 You can look at city plans. You know, uh, you can look at where the city is planning on growing. Uh, those are published plans in terms of, okay, this is where we're thinking of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of growing. Uh, and then I go not all the way to the, you know, in the U.S. we say the boondocks, uh, not all the way to like the rural areas, but I go right, you know, right outside where I can see the city there, Igenifikia, but I can see it there. But it's within proximity to where even when I buy the place, I'm able to go to the city uh, and then I wait for that particular growth. I've been very fortunate in the areas that I've invested in, that growth has usually come within three to four years, okay? So very, very, very quickly. Uh, and so then on average, the appreciation goes up between 10 and 20%. So, you know, I, I, I bought a property once that was 850,000 US dollars. Uh, a year and a half later, it was 1 million. You know, a year and a half after that, it was 1.2 million. So, so with the, to Peleke Pole Pole, yeah. my story, because you've touched on different very powerful segments. Number one, the strategy of buying property. You know, most people assume that just buying land, that's well. Yeah. Apparently, from your conversation, you have to have a design, yeah. right? So there's also the story that we have left hanging here of the first house, yeah. right? The calculation to the second house, 
and when do things get easier? Yeah. So let's start with the story. Yeah, the first house, right? And then we'll come to okay. the conversation of the strategy. Like, how do why do I buy this land? Yeah. What value does it bring? Yeah. Uh, because I also want to touch in, I'm very interested in touching in and touching on if most properties um, uh, appreciate uh, between uh, between an average of three to five percent, how can you afford it? Where, when banks give loans at 12, say, we, we get to 18%. Yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. But let's start with the first house. Yeah. So with the first house, so when I bought my first house yes. um, uh, in, in D.C., it's actually four blocks from the White House. So I used to... Four go blocks on, from yeah. the White House. So when I, when I got posted uh, at, the, uh, at the World Bank, I looked at the rental prices and I said, you know, this is a very highly expensive city. So, you know, two bedroom, three bedrooms were going for you know, $2,500, you know, $3,500 for a three bedroom. This was in 2013, so 11 years ago. So you can imagine what they are now. For me, I'd come from Texas. The most expensive I had ever paid for an apartment was $800. I just could not fathom paying $3,500 for rent. And I thought to myself, there is no way I'm going to build someone else's wealth. Okay. Now, I understand a lot of people may not have the ability or even the choice to be able to pick when they can rent and when they can buy. Huh? There are market forces that may inhibit, you know, poverty or other things. Huh? I was at a particular point where I could choose. I could choose to rent, I could choose to buy. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, I'm making a long-term commitment here because I'm going to be in D.C. for the next 10 years. So why in the world would I pay 3500 to someone else per month huh? to someone else when I can pay 2500 to the bank um, and, you know, get a mortgage and, and, and build equity. Now, that works in a place where interest rates are reasonable. To put it into perspective, my house, I bought it, the interest rate for that house was 2.75%, okay? Things have changed. What determines the 2.7%? Your credit score, your yeah. credit rating, or the leverage you have in terms of bargaining with the bank? No, it's not the leverage you have in terms of bargaining with the bank. If you're Elon Musk, yes. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. but ah. if even a normal, you know, a millionaire doesn't have that part of it. The, mm -hmm. the interest rates are driven by market forces. Pure okay, okay. Um, you can buy points to bring your interest rate down within certain aspects, mm -hmm. um, but it's essentially it's it's a, it's a time value of money. It's just you know what we for us we're like okay, I'm gonna give you the money now, so that you can go and do something. Uh, you will pay it to me over the course of thirty years. But if I had given you 100, that 100 will not be the same 100 30 years from now because of inflation. Okay? So I need to add the Something aspect like of that. inflation. So that's where the bank will add that 3%, you know, you know, to assume inflation, plus the interest rate, you know, so that they can now, beyond the inflation, that's Business. their profit. Yes. Okay? And then all the fees. Um, so at that particular time, it was very fortunate that the interest rates were 2. around 7%. 2%. So me, I was for a 30-year mortgage, I was getting for 2.75%. Now that becomes much more reasonable uh, because you can, you're able to afford, you know, your, the, the amount that is going to interest relative to the whole entire principle is, is, is not a lot. Um, and then now what you're doing is you're building that equity. So, so as I mentioned, the house itself is appreciating naturally, and then I'm paying down the mortgage. So if I bought the place for a million dollars and I'm paying every month, see, in a, in a decrease, the yes. amount that I, that, that, that I owe. So equity is, uh, the amount of money you've been paying is not lost. Yeah. That's your money. Yeah. Plus the down payment. Yeah. Plus the uh, appreciation value yeah. of this yeah. property. So should so, you decide to sell, yeah. this is your money. Yeah. So to put in a very simple calculation, equity is the difference between what you owe the bank and what your property is worth. So if you owe the bank 500,000 and your property is worth 800,000, your equity is 300,000. That 300,000, you can borrow against it or you can take it out. So if I buy a house for 500,000 today and tomorrow I hear rumors that it is 800,000, yeah. I have 300,000 overnight. Yeah. That would be unlikely, <laughs> you know, overnight. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> You'd have been one of the best investors. But in, in two, three years, in some markets, yeah, that is, that is realistic. Okay. okay. Um, uh, and so now those type of, of the, the investments. Huh? So the, and for me, there's a very big difference between an investment. It just happened to be living in my investment property. Most people would not yeah, be, yeah. you know, the house that where like I'm building my parents, I'm not putting market considerations into it. I'm, you know, I'm like, mom wants this, dad wants this, what do you want? You want a pool? 
you know, we put a poll. You don't mm -hmm. care, will I ever be able to get the money back from that's a different valuation now. So investment yeah. depends on where you're building yeah. because uh, of the, the commercial aspect yeah. of returns. Yeah. Both so in for, terms of yeah. equity. So for me, that's why I bought in downtown DC because downtown DC is a very transient city. I'm four blocks from the White House. There's always a change of administration every four years on average. The Senate and the, and the, um, and the, leg and the House you know, have elections every two years. So there are always interns, there are always people coming in every two years. So it's a very high rental market. So there's always someone renting. And a two bedroom, because if you're going to DC, you're not gonna buy a house if you're only there for a year and a half. You're gonna rent. So I know there was always been someone was available. Now, yes. if you have bought a place in Lodua and you built a two bedroom and the amount of pool of people you can you know, rent from are like two, you know, you always have a vacant property and say, mm -hmm. I, you know, real estate is not working for me, but it's because you bought real estate in a place that you can't rent. So in the process of wealth creation, real estate only makes sense if you do the mathematics of the demand yeah. for that property yeah. and the value it brings to yeah. other people who yeah. may need it. Yeah. So to your point on the equity now, so I use that example. Huh? I bought it at 500,000. I had, uh, you know, actually mine, I bought it at 529,000. And uh, in three years later, um, it was worth about 875,000. Okay, so I just went to the bank and I got, uh, you call- uh, um, A financing? The, yeah, so it, no, no refinancing. So you can do that. Actually, there are two options. Huh? You, can get, you can get a home loan where you just refinance. So you refinance for the entire, because remember the bank will always refinance you for the value of the house. Huh? Uh, so if you tell them, okay, I want to refinance this house, it's now worth 800,000, they'll say, okay, we will do you know, 80% of that, or whatever 80% of that is. Then you can refinance and then you get cash in a lump sum and then you can go buy a, a property. Or you can get what's called a home equity line of credit, where is you don't refinance, you just go to the same bank or a different bank in Italy and you say, hey, I have this house, it's worth 800,000, I owe, Tom, 500,000, I want to borrow against three, this 300,000. Then the bank will loan you, and then in the lien holder, they're listed. You know, there's mortgage one, then mortgage two. Then you take that cash, and that's what I bought my second house with, you know, uh, you use know, in, 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 in cash. Yeah, I used it as a down payment, or buy it in cash, depending on where. In my place, I used it as a down payment, so I didn't have to go ask my mom for money, or my dad for money, or my sisters for money. Uh, I just used that as a down payment did another three years, rinse and repeat, and bought another one. I've, I've bought four properties that way um, in terms of just using the equity on the previous house. So now, you don't have to pay up any of them. You just need to build equi equity on any of yeah. them and then use that as a down payment yeah. to buy another house. Yeah. You use money to make money. Uh, so on the it, first part, you use sweat to make the money. There's no shortcut. <laughs> yeah. You have to sweat yeah. to make money. Yeah, you have to sweat to make money unless you're born, you know, Trump or someone else who's born into wealth. And even then, someone did use sweat to make the money that you're, that you're having. What are some of the strategies you've seen working? You've explained to us, you had to borrow from friends, that's networking, and the, your network is your network. My friend yeah. Gore like to, say, like to say that a lot. What do you think you can tell someone, especially, let's say someone in America, who wants to follow a process of just getting through the first one? Yeah. Uh, strategies to raise yeah. the first down payment. So. If you're doing it right now, it will be difficult. Not impossible, it will be difficult. The reason why it will be difficult is uh, the same thing that's happening across the globe in terms of interest rate hikes, um, and even though they're coming down. So you're not able to build equity that fast because your, your, your mortgage has gone up in terms of the amount that is going to interest vis-a-vis -vis the amount that is going to principal. Because remember, I was borrowing at 2.75%. If you're doing it right now, you're borrowing at 5.5%. So your mortgage is higher. So if I was paying 2,500, you're probably paying you know, 3,500, of which that extra thousand is just going to the interest payment. Huh? So then as a result, you know, interest is not equity. That's just the money that the, that the bank makes. Uh, but what I would say to someone who wants to do this is, one, you have to be very determined. Uh, you have to research the areas that you want to do. You also have to ask yourself, why is it you're doing it? And I think that's where a lot of people lose, lose the aspect. Huh? Are you just doing it uh, to make money? Um, or is there an end goal to the particular purpose? Uh, so for me, the end goal, which yes, is the, the, making money is a byproduct, not the end in of itself. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's essentially what you want to do. For me, I, I wanted to retire much earlier. Um, and and by retire, I mean from formal employment, mm. which I did. So I retired from the World Bank at the age of 37. So I'm, I'm done 
and then started my own company uh, that I'm running. So I work because I choose to, not because I have to, which is a very different aspect. But in order to get to where you have that particular choice, you have to lay out your blocks very well. So for me, it was an investment in real estate. It's not the only avenue that I've invested in. Other people may do this through other avenues as well, whether it's technology, whether it is startups, whether it is you know, uh, T-bills or T-bonds, depending on where you are. You can invest into something and, um, and, and grow it at this roughly the same rate. But bottom line, what it all boils down to, it does come to the sweat of your brow in terms of working to it. You have to have strategic and proper planning. You have to understand the market that you're involved in, the market forces that drive that market. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that can happen that are completely out of your control. So DC was a very highly rentable market, and then COVID happened. And then no one wanted to live in cities anymore, and my apartment was vacant for eight months. What do you do? You still have to pay a mortgage, okay? Yeah. If you don't have a rainy day fund, you're really going to be stressed huh? because the bank is not asking you or to live if you have a tenant yeah, yeah, yeah? you still yeah. have to have to pay yeah. other people some people uh, what happens especially a lot of young people is that they over leverage themselves so one they buy assets that are not appreciating that are depreciating assets i like anyone like cars huh? but a car is a depreciating asset or well, mostly regardless of how much you love it no one will ever have that same sense of valuation that you do and so a result when you go to sell it if you bought it for three million kenya shillings you're going to be ah Two million maximum not only because they don't value it the same you do it has wear and tear you know it is growing old shots are busting and you know uh technology is changing so unless you're investing in a classic car you know you know a 1969 you know shelby mustang or like you know 1953 aston martin more than likely you know the so asset is you're probably buying your car so that you can sell it in the year 2004. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When people say, you oh, know, there used to be a time where yeah, cars used yeah, to go on yeah, the thing. Yeah. Uh, so one, you have to make sure that it's not a depreciating asset. Mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, you have to remove emotion from it. Okay. Don't emotion. ask yourself, what is it that I want to buy? If I was rent buying my place so that I can rent in it, in, or I can live in it in perpetuity, I would have, I would not have bought that apartment. I asked myself. What would someone living in DC want in an apartment? It's not about you. Yeah, it's not about you. Uh, because, yeah, you may like, you know, salmon colored walls. And that's why most apartments are painted white or grayish, uh, because people like neutral colors. This DC apartment yeah. is a beautiful story. Four blocks <laughs> from the White House. Four blocks, uh, I don't know how we calculate distance, but four blocks seems like the same neighborhood. It's about 60 right? yards, so about 60 meters. So you technically are in yeah. the same no, uh, neighborhood or yeah. subgroup with the president of... <laughs> <laughs> Let me just <laughs> put it this way. Uh, like I would walk to work five days a week. At least two of them, I was caught in the motorcade. Like I stop and wait for the motorcade. It became a frequent sign. I, I knew the motorcade routes, even though they are random, because yeah. there are only a few ways to yeah. go into someone's yes, home. Yes, so yes, I yes. just avoided them entirely. And that's where you wanted to live? That's not necessarily where I wanted to live. That's where um, you thought that that's, deal. I... I wanted to live there for two reasons. One, I did not want a long commute, okay, okay. and I was willing to pay more for a property in order to save the time of a commute, you know? Okay. So that was one. So for me, time was valuable. So I can sit in traffic for two hours, or I can pay $1,000 more and have that two hours per day, times five weeks, 10 hours, times, you know, uh, and then you con continue, then you look at that time that you've saved, and if you convert how much you're being paid, and then to the dollars, you're like, actually, here I'm saving a lot more than yeah, I would be yeah, paying. Yeah. Two, I knew that other people would want the same thing because who wants to sit in a commute? Uh, you want to be like, how long? Actually, I used to, 8 o'clock meeting, meaning we're going to get 7.30. Now, Oga, a bus suti, 10 minutes, I'm at work, and I'm sitting there. When Guinea, while you talk with a bus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Unajua, our audience are, are very calculative people. Man. <laughs> our audience has a lot of calculative people. So, Mtu Asha Pige Simo. Asha Pige Sabu Akajua, we unawaganga na seven minutes. Much to the chagrin of my parents, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. So, and I'm like, you say that it's not possible to build equity as fast as, as in now, as fast as you had a chance to when you did in 2014 not with the current interest rate the the yeah, not with the current interest rate of course they're falling and if they do fall then yes you you can repeat the process so does this mean does this mean that the people now who are interested in building wealth 
are priced out of the real estate market or uh, real estate as a business is now obsolete. Like it's no, no, it's not obsolete. It will never be obsolete because people have to live somewhere. Okay, you know there are a few things you should always invest in: are toilet paper because people are always going to use them, right? Uh, medicine because people are always going to fall sick, food uh, because people are always going to eat, and homes because people have to. Then we're not going to stay in trees, uh, so there'll always be something, and the population always grows. Uh, so it's just that right now they are momentarily priced out. Of, momentarily. Yeah, momentarily. Because interest will not always stay high. Huh? They, they, they will come down. Uh, and it's an ebb and flow. Huh? You know, the, the, the markets, you know, autocorrect. Huh? It's a supply and demand aspect. Huh? So right now, what's happening is interest rates have gone high, which have done what? They have diminished supply. So there are a lot of people waiting to buy a house, which has also driven up prices. It's Aikai. And then now the prices are going to start coming down because people are not buying. Uh, and then you're going to be like, oh, now it's a seller's market, you know, uh, and it will not always be a seller's market or a buyer's market. When I, when I bought, it was purely a buyer's market. Interest rates were low. There was a lot of supply. You had the opportunity, you know, you just, you know, Natakaile, and more than likely you were the only one bidding for it. And in, in, thank you. In, in terms of the wealth creation strategy, um, let's say, um, what's the, how good is the idea of, Let's say you live alone ten percent. If you, how how or how realistic is the idea of coming up with a hundred percent payment for your first property? Do you have to use debt, or how realistic is it to build wealth without yeah. debt? So you have to take this within the context of the different uh, economics uh, or nation states that you find yourself in. Okay, um, in Kenya and in a lot of developing countries, um, more than likely. For a lot of people, uh, they are priced out of a mortgage. Uh, in, in, in Kenya, uh, a lot of people just don't have the capacity uh, to even have that discussion uh, with, with the bank. I mean, they just, you know, the door is closed even before. Even the thought, you can't entertain it uh, because of what is being asked. Uh, um, for a lot of people, they may not be in formal employment, and so it becomes too dif uh, difficult for them to prove ability to pay because you have to prove ability to pay to the bank. Uh, ability to pay works very well in a formalized system where they can pull your credit. Uh, you have a formal structure that there's religious payments. Um, so one good way that the U.S. does uh, that you can't get away from it, um, which would be very difficult in, in, in Kenya. So the first thing the bank will ask for after they ask you for your pay stubs is your last three years of tax returns. And why do they ask for your last three years of tax returns? Because they use tax returns to basis your income. Oh. Now, if you're in a country where, you know, akuna mtu nataka kulipa taxes, the banks have a very difficult time trying to figure out. It doesn't mean that you can't model ability to pay without taxes, but the notion here, at least in the United States, I'll just speak for the United States, is that, you know, people fear the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and so they're like, okay, if that person is not lying to the IRS, then they're not lying to us. Yeah. And so they will say, taxes are due on April 15th. If you're trying to buy a house right now, they'll probably say, Dogo, let's wait until April 15th. We see what your uh, tax tax returns are. And if your tax returns mismatch what you're filling in on the form that you make, then they have a lot of questions. Yeah. So then those questions fall in two ways. One, you're either lying to us or you're lying to the government. Uh, and regardless of which one it is, we don't want to be in that because if you're lying to the government, then our house is in peril. Okay. okay? Because, yeah. you know, the government can foreclose on your house for failure to pay taxes if they wanted to, yeah, right? And then yeah. the bank is out of the water. Now, but more precisely to your question, when you have um, a formalized market that is able to, you know, weigh all these things, it becomes much easier for people to acquire wealth and more so to acquire a property. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, that we can't do that in Kenya. We do that very well. Uh, it's just that the way that the mortgage system is designed right now is not designed to favor the common one inchi. It's, it's difficult. And so as a result, most people have to resort to cash. Homes, at least in the last 100, 150 years of, of modern economics, are not things that you buy with cash uh, because they are high value assets that require a significant amount. So most people's homes are three, five, some 10, 15 years of earnings, you know, like Zotec combined, you put it there in 10 to 15 years, that's your home. Huh? So being able to do that in a cash aspect, 
is, makes it very difficult for people. And so then they're always renting. And there's nothing wrong with renting if rents are affordable. Uh, but the way that at least it has worked in some systems is that, you know, when you talk about wealth, we're not talking about cash. We're talking about accumulated wealth. And usually that is more so packed in assets like property and otherwise. And that's what's handed over. And so a vast majority of people don't start from scratch. So in my particular one, the one who will come after me, or in my father's case, I have the whole entire wealth that my father has because it will be bequeathed to us. You know? And we, have, we may not live in the house, and more than likely we will not live in that house, but that house has a value that you know, brings to this particular generation, and then we build that particular one. And, uh, and so you don't have the issue of you know, people being priced out of housing. And uh, because if you're priced out of housing, it creates a lot of other economic problems. Uh, because you know, remember this from standard one, what are the you know, things, food, shelter, and clothing. And, and, clothing uh, uh, and food and clothing, you know, clothing may, I can, if, if you mana, I can wear this suit religiously, for a whole year, it doesn't mean that I have to wear a blue one tomorrow. Huh? Yes, yes. Um, but shelter, you know, it's it needs to stand storms. It needs to it's it's a little bit longer of an asset. Right? It's it's it has a, a little bit more value than a shirt. Or uh, mm -hmm. and so if people are priced out of it, it makes it difficult for them to you know to acquire these other things. And because you are focusing on a hierarchy of needs. So, we lastly say there's there's a guy called. Uh, Maslow, and Maslow, you probably remember this from class, he came up with a hierarchy of needs, okay? Uh, and there are five of them, with the biggest one being self-actualization, which is where the Scandinavians are. Uh, and then, you know, some of, some of us, you know, are all the way down at the, the what we call this basic needs. Huh? Yeah. So, at the bare minimum, we're all concerned about survival, okay? So, right now, if I give you a plate of food right there, you're not hungry, more than likely. Um, you'll focus on your laptop, you'll go do other things that you want to do, okay? But if I read you a food for today, for tomorrow, for the next day, eventually that MacBook of yours will start being less valuable because you can't eat it. No, I thought you said that. You would say I'll eat it. <laughs> no, <laughs> so you'll focus on the, on the food. And once your food is solved, you go to the next level of basic needs, which is clothing. And once that's solved, you go to shelter eventually to where you get to a point of self-actualization where you care about others, you know, as a society, you know, about yourself. And if people can't go about that hierarchy of needs, when I say two upper, where you, you're only worried about food and clothing, you can never understand how people have disposable income. Even the concept of disposable income doesn't come to you because all your income and all your sustenance goes to food, shelter, and, and clothing. Which is a good thing you say. Uh, you say... Um be, let, let, me, let, me, let me track back, yeah. Kidogo. Uh, disposable income. Before we discuss disposable income, uh, I was at a GM was today, and uh, I saw a statement and I was like, I can't wait to bring this up with you. They are looking forward to a place where they can bring interest rates to below 1.5%. And I believe 1.5% is 1.5% per month. Because we calculated uh, the mathematics comes to 18% per year. When you talk about you getting a mortgage or getting a house at 2.7%, I believe this is 2.5% 2 2 per year. Per year, yeah. Right? Per year. 2.7% per year versus 18% is a stark contrast. Yeah. But then my question is, does the fact that the currency is different, the dollar is stronger than the shilling matter or 18% uh, and 2.7% is just, is there, is there a formula that the 2.7% in dollars is more than 18%? Uh, I think the currency itself doesn't, okay, it, in general terms, the currency itself doesn't matter. Uh, in minor yeah. things, it, it may matter because, you know, uh, it, a reserve currency uh, lets people trust it a lot more. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they're willing to, if you come here and I give you a Ugandan shilling, you know, and I give you a Kenyan shilling, and I tell you which one do you want to get paid in, uh, more than likely you're going to pick the Kenyan shilling, one, because of familiarity, mm -hmm. two, because more people use it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So now uh, you get at 2.7%, that's a good deal, probably under 5% now, as much as yeah. uh, 
interest rates are high. Yeah. Does it mean that the game of wealth creation is rigged for us in a context like, say, in a society like Kenyan? Like, um, my chance to create wealth through real estate because of the interest rates, uh, I can't get that chance even if I want. So I wouldn't say you can't, because uh, I don't want to generalize. Uh, it would be too strong of a statement. I would say it's difficult, and for a lot of people, impossible. Uh, difficult, if not impossible. Impossible is a yeah. good word. Yeah, because um, it means, OK, think of just the regular Wanjiko or, uh, uh, or the regular Omondi you know, sitting somewhere in either Kibera or, or, or Madare or in some parts of, of Nyahururu. OK, um, what is their thought of owning a home. Uh, probably for some of them, even the concept itself, that I can actually have something that is mine, that I don't pay rent on, is just unfathomable, mm -hmm. you know, because they can barely afford the ugali that they're eating. And so for them to think of, you know, we're talking about affordable housing at six million, you know, like six million, yeah. you know, it's an unfathomable figure when you're making 100 to 500 shillings a day. I mean, you could pour your whole entire 100% of your income and you still won't uh, get that house. But then there are other things that are eating away at your income. Uh, there is inflation, there's things that you have to buy, there is taxes, whether directly or indirectly in terms of VATs. You know, so by the time this particular person is done with that 500 shillings, or may I turn a 50 bob, and now they have to save that 50 bob, how long will you have to save the 50 bob per day before you get to 6 million? And the 6 million is not, Constant, right? It's not pegged. It will always be six million. Huh? It's 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 increasing, huh? uh, because people are, are adding value and assets, and that's what inflation does. So this person is completely priced out. So for them, they can't even think of ever owning a house. Forget a house. They can't ever think of ever owning a car. They can't even think of never having to borrow for to pay for their school fees. So you know, it goes back to that hierarchy of needs. You know, owning a house, you may go, oh god. You know, they are more like. I'm more worried about the water that I need to drink and the mm. food that I need to eat and the provision that I need to make for my kids. It doesn't matter what any administration says, you know, I'm just, I'm not listening to them. Then what does this mean? Everybody wants to become rich, right? Do we just accept that the game is rigged, that only the few who can get to, um, to master how it's played can yeah. get through? EIDIR, yeah. yeah, you work uh, one day, you'll get rich, it's a lie. Yeah, yeah. So... I would say the concept of everybody wants to get rich um, is, is not a term that I would use. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that okay, everybody may desire to get rich, but I think what people desire and want is consistency and predictability. I just want to know that I can put my kid through school without headache. I just want to know that if a chance encounter with, I don't know, a flu will not put my kid in the coffin because I could not, you know, uh, pay for the hospital bills. I think people are thinking along those parameters, not like wow. I want to become Elon Musk. So the idea should not to be rich. The idea should be to be comfortable. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain, you know, and I think for a lot of young people now, I don't want to generalize this, okay? There, there, there are people who are really struggling, okay? Uh, I think my friend uh, Jimmy, when Jiggy was here and he was talking about poverty, there's something called abject poverty and it's very difficult to break that cycle, okay? You're born in poverty. It is highly unlikely that you will live out of poverty because you forget disposable income. There's no income to put you through school. There's no income to educate you. And that's why universal education is important because it better society as a whole. Because there are some people, uh, like myself, for example, uh, who sit in the seat, who would not have been able to pay for school if it wasn't for the concept of either a benefactor or universal education. Um, my family went to the United States because my dad got a scholarship with the National Council of Churches of Kenya. That's how he got there. And that allowed me to have an access of education just by sheer opportunity, game of chance, that other people would not have been able to that was paid for by other people's taxes. Does this mean that you say something very strong, you're born in a cycle of poverty? Does this mean there are people who, when you see the kind of poverty you're dealing with, don't even try? 
cut up or um and the key there are some like that and that's why development is important i mean as 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 a country as a whole yeah uh, and that's why i'm passionate about development because um the goal the world bank has a as a goal of you know reducing uh, uh, extreme poverty to 3% uh, and the reason why why not zero um, uh, to 3% yeah to 3% uh, you know the question as an intellectual that's why not zero we should eliminate it is because there there's just what we call i don't want to say a game of chances just think what i'll say lottery of life huh? um you don't choose who your parents are you don't choose where you're born i mean yeah. there are some people who out of nothing of their own were born in Darfur okay all they know is war poverty and famine yeah. you know like this glass of water you know for them is you know worth more than a million dollars for some people for us i could dump it out without a single thought whatsoever to it simply because of where i'm born nothing that i did to have that experience okay now if you're in a situation where you can do something you know to you know uh, equate you know the the platform for others then by all means do it it goes to your question is that you know people want to be rich and there are some people who will you know uh, keep you from getting there what i'd say is i think people want a comfortable life uh, and the point i was trying to make earlier is that there are people who are not able to generate wealth not necessarily because of the life choices that have been faced them but because of the idiotic things that they do themselves huh? so you come okay let me, i'll use you as an example so maybe uh, you won't feel bad uh, i don't know anything about your life but uh, you seem very well dressed you have you have a, you have a nice suit and everything Thank else you. um the choices you could be making financially um could be one of keeping up with the joneses or you're buying this car because your friend peter has it and you want to show peter uh you're buying this property because you just yeah, you know they are they're giving good deals or it's like oh no this is where i want to take my girlfriends and you know look at that view and then they'd be like oh wow aspect those type are very i would say limiting in terms of growth huh? so you find that someone may be making comfortably 300,000 kenya shillings which is a pretty good comfortable salary but their expenditures are more focused on the wants than on the needs uh so where you look at where they are living uh okay i've nothing against anyone who lives in kileleshu or who lives in kitsu or lives in runda the question is like are you living there because you can afford it uh or are you living there because you want to show others that you live there and some people don't even know that they're living there because they are showing off uh that's how bad it is uh you know you're like you're blind uh, and you don't know that you're yeah, blind you think yeah. you can see <laughs> it's not about you yeah. it's about yeah yeah So then you need a pay advance huh? and then of course Fuliza makes significant amount of money from you because you're living outside your means. So two things. What is disposable income? What is living within your means? Because remember there's a there's a part if you are living within your means you would have chosen to be comfortable not collect money for a down payment yeah. to pay for a house, yeah. right? Uh, and you explained very well yeah. that yes you are investing into something that yeah. will grow. What uh living within your means sometimes people may interpret as limiting ambition yeah. no so that's that's not what i mean so for me i'm not talking about frugality or like a miser huh? you know like you know i don't want to spend money no that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about living within your means I'll give the example that i gave uh, earlier um when i called my my friend renzo um there's some people who are who, if they were making that transaction i would say don't do it why don't do it because your 12000 and my 12000 are not the same yes you can flop the dollars you can flop the shillings we call that fungibility they can be used if you give me a dollar and i give you a dollar you can use it the same way i could use that dollar but the value of that dollar to me may be very different to you in terms of how much work did i put into it is it disposable can i live without it or is it there's an opportunity cost involved to it because if i buy something with this shilling I can't buy something else with that shilling. That shilling is gone. I can use another shilling, but that one, that one is gone. We call that aspect if I buy this bottle of water with that shilling, it means that I may have forgone this and this is the opportunity cost. Um and for a lot of people they don't have that discussion amongst themselves. Uh so for me, you know, my perspective, personal opinions is that when I was calling my friend Renzo to buy this particular car it's not something that I just woke up in the morning and I and I wanted to get it I'd been planning for it the deal was so good that I decided to bring those plans here okay but if I'm going to bring those plans here I have to you know figure out where those resources are coming from am I 
taking them out of my rent so that I can get this car or I'm missing somebody's school fees or whatever so that I can get this particular car? Or is it within my whole entire realm of income that I can actually afford this car? Now, people have to enjoy life, okay? We are just not called to, you know, be miserable. Uh, there's a heaven and, you know, a lot of, uh, and I'm a, a religious person, um, all glory and happiness is not just set for heaven. There's this part where you're here uh, and you can enjoy life uh, within reason, of course, uh, uh, in terms of what you do and understanding that your choices do have consequences. You have to be, uh, you know, really honest with yourself as to whether you can live with those consequences. It doesn't mean that every financial decision I've made has been one that I, you know, would do it again. They that have been. You, there are financial mistakes that you can yeah, afford. Yeah, there are financial mistakes that you can afford. Uh, and then you learn. Some people don't learn from their mistakes, particularly financial ones. Huh? Um, and so for me, losing 12,000 will not put me out of the house. Okay? Uh, it will not, you know, I, I won't, you know, uh, miss food over it. Now, that's me. For the Someone else, it may be 5,000. For others, it may be 50 million. Okay, But you need to know where, where your lever you're is. At. Yeah, where you're playing at. You know, when Elon Musk, and I keep referencing him, not necessarily because I like him, but you know, he has done some pretty, what would be like, audacious things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his investment into Tesla was all the money that he got from PayPal, 55 million. I mean, he cleaned out you know, and put this particular one. It was a big gamble. And you could say, man, why would you put 55 million in, into that? Well, he had the, the willingness and the ability to lose it. It was not the end of the world for him. You know, he could lose 55 million. And I'm sure articulately, he probably conceived that he could lose it, but he was willing to take that chance. It's not like a, the Russian roulette uh, aspect of a gamble. So if you think going back to Russian roulette, just because you played Russian roulette and succeeded doesn't mean it was not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and that's what people do. They do game of chance. Hey, apo ni me kuwa lucky. And so you assume that that is a the prescribed system. A it, system. Uh, it, it is not. Uh, you know, even a broken cock is right two times in a day. So does this mean all spending should be based, does it mean that all spending should be based on what you're willing to lose? And if you want to generalize it, yeah, I would say, yeah, spending should be based on what you're willing to lose. Um, now, there are some things all you can do is um, help to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Help to uh, figure out the probability or the risk factor of, of losing that. Um, and there are some aspects that there's a good chance that I may lose that, you know. How do you, what is disposable income? How do you build it? And when do you know? Uh, the range you're playing at in terms of disposable income? Yeah, um, so disposable income, I like to look at things definitionally. I just mean dispose. Huh? You can put it in the dustbin, you know? Or oh, money that you can <laughs> yeah, put in the you dustbin. you can put it in the dustbin. Huh? If we want to be just very generic with the term. Huh? It means that mm -hmm. I'm still okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, now, because we are not, let's say, hooligans, it doesn't mean that with disposable income, we just drink it all away. Huh? Yeah. Uh, because the Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Huh? The sun will shine for others, it will rain. Um, you know, there's a time and place for everything. Um, and just with the way that life is, for me and for most people I advise is use disposable income as your insurance policy when this income that you need for is not guaranteed. So put it that way, is that if you don't have a rainy day fund, start one. It's called a rainy day fund for when things are raining. Thank you. Rainy day fund. Uh, people talk about, and I believe this is a common belief in our society, that when you put money somewhere at it for just in case something happens, that just in case happens and clears that money. A, a self-fulfilling prophecy? Uh, no. Uh, so, you only, so the average aspect is that you should have a rainy day fund of between three to six months. Uh, liquid. Okay? By liquid. liquid, I mean it's in the bank or it's something that you can easily three to convert. Three months of yeah, all convert. your expenses. Yeah. yeah. Anything after that, you're just now losing money because inflation is eating away at your money. And then now you need to pack that into an asset. 
that is appreciating, okay? And they can be multiple things, huh? Um, and they don't all have to all be like big assets like real estate, but they can be other types, you know? They can be financial securities, they can be stocks, they can be bonds, they can be mutual funds. Um, if we're looking at the market, they can be multiple other things. Join a chama, you know? Um, Three to six months, that's liquid, that's a rainy day fund. Yeah. Uh, if everything stopped, you can continue yeah. surviving for three to six months. Yeah. Anything above that, you say you're losing money. Yeah, to inflation. Uh, inflation is eating away your money. So, for example, ah, last year... Three in, to six months yeah. because inflation counts from one year. Yeah, well, not necessarily one year. It's just that... So, last year, Kenya inflation was 9%. Uh, so if annually, you, Yeah, right? annually. Uh, so, if you had 100, uh, 10,000 shillings, you know, in... in you've lost uh, 900 you've, shillings. You've lost 900 shillings. Uh, in terms of... It's not lost in Taitime Potea. Yes. It's lost in terms your buying power has reduced, reduced by, by 900, 900 shillings. In which case, Sawa, uh, first of all, we say this idea of I have 5 million just chilling in the bank is foolish. Yeah, especially if it's in uh, a currency that is, uh, sorry to say, uh, you know, bouncing all over the place. You know? Aha, yes, <laughs> uh -huh, nice. So if you have six months uh, worth of... Um, Let's call it the rainy day fund. Yeah, six months. Now, if you one year, I could denyesha, right? No, no, it's, it's not there because babu ati denyesha or just a kudenyesha. You know, that's the thing, is that? Let me put it that way. Uh, most of us have cars, okay? Or some of us have cars, uh, uh, and some of us have health insurance, okay? You don't take health insurance or cancel health insurance because you didn't become sick last month. No, but or, this is different. This is cash money you're holding. Yeah, yeah, but you know, think of it as an insurance policy, okay? It's, it's an insurance policy in case something happens. I, I, I have a friend of mine, uh, we'll get to him. He's a debt expert. Yeah. He says, um, his strategy is, Gor Semelango, he says that um, you, instead of having 5 million shillings in, in cash, you'd rather have, uh, a line of credit of five million that you can access anytime. That's a good, and by the rainy day fund, you notice that I didn't say what type of, ah, uh, of instrument it needs to be. Yes, yes, it yes. just needs to be accessible, okay? Uh, my rainy day fund right now is in that good example of, of debt because most of my funds have been poured into investments. Into investments, and particularly companies that I've started, like, like Wire, for example. So. That part, it's not liquid, it's growing. So I can't go to my company and be like, okay, look, you guys are worth 18 and a half million, which they are, and say, I'm going to I'm going to remove it and start, you know, cutting cells out away. Because I'm looking at not when it's at 18 and a half million, but when it will be at 100 or 200 million. Uh, and then that's when you're uh, looking to recoup, recoup your investment. I thought the benefit of having a company is having someone you can call anytime. <laughs> Isn't that the beauty of having a company? Or oh, that comes with stages. That comes with stages. Huh? That comes with stages. And of course, if you are, look, let me put it this way. Building a company is like planting a tree. Huh? If you're always chopping off its branches before it reaches maturity, you're not going to have a company for much longer. Huh? So you read it with maturity, then you enjoy its benefits. Huh? The fruits. The fruits. The shade, you can, you know, uh, chop off a, a branch and, you know, use it. I mean, one tree will not, uh, uh, you know, provide timber for your house, uh, but it will help you get there. But so benefits of a company are good. And I mean, not everybody should start a company. I would not recommend that for everyone. It's not a panacea for money problems. In fact, <laughs> it, mm. it causes a lot of money problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but going back to the thing about uh, a rainy day, um, you need to have about, you know, three to six months in accessible funds. They can be in savings. They can be, I wouldn't just put them in, I, I, I would never put a rainy day fund under the mattress or just in cash. Uh, um, it needs to be even something that accrues. It won't accrue much because it's a short-term investment. So, for example, some people may choose to put it into a rolling CD. So you have two CDs that mature every three months. Mm -hmm. So you always have access to, access to that particular money. Some may choose to put it in, in T-bills. Uh, I sat on a company where we had a lot of reserves, but by mandate, we had to have those reserves as liquid. So we always bought three, uh, uh, three six, nine, 12 uh, maturity uh, CDs. So at any given time, we were three months away from, from, uh, from maturity. In which case, 
then I, I am starting to be inclined to believe uh, the line of thought that there's nothing like a sure bet investment. Because I'm not a skeptic, yeah. but think about it. When you talk of real estate, we have BAS, right? Uh, when you talk of T-bills, uh, you mentioned them yeah. a lot. Uh, Jimmy was on uh, Spice uh, recently talking about the rate at which our economy is going. Uh, the government could hold on to the, uh, to the, to the treasury bonds for the longest time. Uh, up to 30 years, you can't access your money. Or you could only access 30%, and that could mean even your and pesa and pesa as in even your pesa yeah. balance that's yeah. scary stuff yeah uh, when it comes to stocks companies do do the companies thing. do yeah yeah you're right there is nothing for certain uh, maybe heaven uh, or the fact that we will be born and and, and will die uh. mm -hmm. um there's always a risk there's a risk in everything in fact if anybody tells you an investment is risk-free just run lie. away that's a lie it's the biggest lie uh just like the devil um every investment has risk what you need to ask yourself is, how much risk are you willing to tolerate? That starts off by knowing where you are mm -hmm. in your life journey, but also in your financial journey. So to put it in perspective, we were raising uh, $3 million for, for Wire last year. I had someone who I knew who was referred to me by my mom that wanted to invest $100,000 uh, in, into Wire. Uh, of course, we were taking investors. Let's but, put this into perspective. 100000 in Karibu, $20 million. <laughs> <laughs> but this lady uh, was a truck driver uh, and she was approaching, uh, you know, retirement. Um, she was approaching retirement in three years. And she I has said, raised that money? Yeah. In she had raised, she had, yeah, and she had raised and this was her retirement. She wanted to come to Kenya and, and retire. And I said, mom, look, in good faith, I cannot take your money because the first thing I do when I ask an investor, what is your goal? What are you looking for this money to do? When, what is your goal and when are you looking to touch to touch this money. When I say there's not a sure investment, um, is that you have to let it stand the test of time because time smooths those risks, okay? Yeah. So if you're investing in wire um, and you're planning on retiring in three years, wire is a startup, okay? We are not seeing that maturity probably for about another seven to 10 years, yes, which yes, will yes. mean three years from now, you'll come back and tell us, hey, I need my money, but we're like, we can't touch it. It's you know, it's locked up. Um, and then, too, we may have booms and busts, okay? So for me, what I told her was like, you want your money to be very, very liquid. And I said, I would take 80% of it, uh, and I would put it in um, T-bills and T-bonds, nothing with a maturity longer than three years, because she wanted her money in cash at the very end. I don't know what she wanted to do uh, with it um, when she was done, but, you know, either build property or something. Uh, and so... And then the rest, I would just put it into a high yield savings account that is giving you five to six percent, um, and then that's something that you can you can touch. Then this other one, you 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 decrease your risk. So every investment has a risk profile, and if someone is not telling you, you should ask your investor. The investor should ask you what is your risk profile, and if your investor has not asked you that, then you need another investor. Okay, you need someone else to manage your money mm. uh, or to manage whatever it is uh, yeah. because your risk profile determines what you want to do. So with a house, with a mortgage of 30 years, are you willing to hold on for 30 years? Um, are you willing to you know, pay that mortgage consistently for 30 years? Uh? Uh, if your plan is to pay the mortgage only for a year and then you need to recover your asset, then you should probably not invest in real estate. You should invest in something else that has a maturity of one year. And there are multiple things. You can go to, to companies and buy what's called a convertible note that has a one-year maturity. You can go to your bank and say, I want a high-yield savings account or I want a CD. You can go to other... There are multiple ways that you can. Um, so anywhere between one, the most common one, and you have the six months for short-term you know, lending. Yeah. You have one year, 24 months, some of 18 months then three, five, and 10. So those are the most common aspects. Huh? Yeah, yeah. uh, so you just ask yourself, where do you, where do you, where do you fall? If this money is for school fees, you don't lock it up for 10 years. That's why SVB collapsed, by the way. The bank. Yeah. They had bought a 10-year uh, um, uh, maturity, and they needed the ca They had the cash. Malikona Pesa. It just, they could not touch it for 10 years. I, I, I think we can both agree on real money and I think this redefines the concept of time is money. Real money has to get the benefit of time. Yes. Time 
smooths out the ebbs and the flows. Okay, think of the stock market. Um, if you are retiring in 2008, you, that was a bad year for the stock market. I feel bad for anyone who was retiring in 2008. So uh, if you are retiring uh, in 2008, you had no option but to grow young again. Grow, but that only meant if you had probably put your money in like a year or two. The people uh, who had put it in yeah. for 30 years, they didn't feel. They may have lost 18 percent, you know, of the entire portfolio. Mm. But if they had put 100 thousand and now it's 700 thousand and you lose and you have mm. 600 thousand, you're okay with that because time has smoothed that particular one. If you're not in a rush, you you know, you wait, you wait for it to go. So you always have to ask yourself, what's your time horizon? And the shorter the time horizon, the higher the risk. And I, I see the benefit of time because um, Morgan Housel has a story of a, a janitor who actually made headlines. Is it 2013, 2014, when he passed on and he had saved 8 million shillings, million dollars, dollars yeah, yeah. Million, 8 million dollars in cash and then you're like he had to live such a frugal life to be a, a janitor yeah and you save that kind yeah. that's almost a billion Kenyan yeah. shillings right that's, uh, that's a billion. so yes, it was it was so you're going back to the you know the sweat of your brow um and i don't know his investment portfolio uh but i would venture to say um it was yes eight million in cash that he had but it wasn't eight million in terms of well, I took on share and I like took a banker. It, it was it had compound interest. It was compound interest. So there's some things that are you know you can um, what's the word? You can increase the probability of. Right? So let's say you want to be uh, a millionaire in Kenya shillings, huh? A million in Kenya shillings. <laughs> 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 I love that story. Uh -huh. carry so on, you want carry to be on. in a millionaire in Kenya shillings, okay? Yes. Yes. Um, and you have a hundred thousand, okay. Okay. Yes. Or you have the capacity to get a hundred thousand, mm -hmm. okay. And you're twenty, for example. Um, that is really doable. By just saving, if you want a million, saving a thousand every month consistently. Now, the first few years, it won't look like much. Okay. In fact. Save a thousand, even at an average of six percent. You are a thousand from twenty six, years. Yeah, you look at twenty years every yeah. month. Yeah, a thousand shillings every month. Yeah, I'm going to show you how quickly we can get to a million. Huh? Now, the first first year, you just have what twelve thousand, okay, plus interest. Huh? So let's call it twelve percent. Huh? So you have you know uh, uh, thirteen thousand two hundred, okay, as an example. Not much. It doesn't feel like much. You 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 you, you don't get much. But then that next year is compounded. Remember, you're still saving. Huh? So it's the power of saving plus compounding, not just compounding in itself, huh? yeah, but yeah. saving. If you keep saving that a particular aspect, pretty soon, huh, over the 10 years, uh, and some people will be on, on, on YouTube running this particular math, mm -hmm. but on average, the actual cash you will have put in will be roughly between 180 to 250,000. Getting you to the million would be purely compounded interest. And every six years, this money will double. Every six years. Yes. So the first time it doubled, not that big of a deal. But now when you're at 300,000 and it's starting to double every six years, okay, that one million starting to look much, much closer. So now if you're at 900,000 and I'm giving you 12%, you can quickly see how close you are to a million. That's at 900,000 at 12%. When you're at 1,000, that million at 12%, same percentage, it just looks completely, you know, out of reach. Patience and consistency is just all you need. Um, is not necessarily mean, luck. Please define for us, who is a millionaire? Someone who has a million shillings in cash. Are you a millionaire by virtue of you just have a million shillings in cash? What, what does a millionaire mean? Uh, by definition. So, you know, the U.S. government uses, so we, we're raising, as I mentioned, uh, so, um, uh, and while we are raising for, for my company, Wire, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that we're doing is you have to define what type of investor uh, you're, you're looking for. And the US has two basic definitions. You have an accredited investor, um, and that's someone with a net worth of one million. Net worth. Yeah, net worth of one, one million. million. And the Security and Exchange Commission doesn't really care much about that investor. You can, the, the 
things that I tell you, if you're worth one million, I don't, you know, very simple, I can write it on a piece of paper. But if you're not an accredited investor, the Security and Exchange Commission vis-a-vis -vis the US government wants really to protect that particular that person. person because they have more to lose. What is a net worth of a million dollars? So net worth of a million dollars, it's not necessarily cash. Huh? It's just something that can be converted into cash. You just need to be one million dollars in liquidity. It doesn't matter what type of liquidity it is. It can be but real estate. things that can be converted. Yeah. Well, yeah, to use everything or this, everything can be converted into cash. So part of it could be your earnings, okay? Because um, that's what banks use, for example. The other one is, is assets. Um, so, and, and that's, that's asked a lot. And it, so it's, it's good for people to know their net worth. Yes, I think people is. inflate their numbers a lot, you know, in terms of, uh, they use it as a value system, you know, uh, okay, in terms okay. of like, oh, you, you know my net worth. Yes, uh, yes, aspect yes. of it. it it's, it's good to know because at least for it helps you know your purchasing power. Uh, and how do you calculate the net worth? Is it uh, what you have uh, that can be liquidated? Yeah. What you have, your? so your total assets, whatever they may be, minus your total liabilities, whatever you're left with is your net worth. So you may have people who have a million in cash, but they have debts of 1.2 million. Their net worth is negative. negative. Yeah, 200,000. 200, so they're not millionaires at all by, 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 by definition. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know what their fascination is with, with the term millionaires. I guess it's just people assume that if you're a millionaire, um, you know, maybe there's a sense of happiness or life comes easy. Um, but I, I don't think there is, I don't want to devalue mm -hmm. it and make it seem as if it's not that important yes. because you can fiddle with the numbers. Uh, Trump has done a very good job of, you know, inflating his net worth uh, yeah, yeah. and to do so in order to, to make more money. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the person. Uh, so for me, if you tell me your net worth is five million, I immediately ask, OK, what is it in? Uh, and what are your assets and liabilities? Uh, and, I, and I look at that uh, more systematically to let me know whether that five million is really on paper uh, or it's actually, uh, you know, real, which is in, important if you're looking for an investor. Okay. You know, because I want to know, like, hey, if I come to you uh, or I can depend on you, you're not just saying, you, you know, you, you, proof of funds and they're funds that you, you are, you know, planning to pay your mortgage with. Okay. Aya, um, building the profile to get to a place where you can be comfortable financially, uh, from what I gather is you cannot escape proper use of debt. You can, you cannot, ex uh, <laughs> Let me, I, 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 you, one thing that you'll see is that I, I don't like to generalize uh, because I don't think it's as simple as black and white. But what I would say is that the proper use of debt does really help you leverage wealth okay. building. I would not be a millionaire if I did not have debt to help me get to that particular place. Okay, it took debt to get me to the assets that I've built okay. uh, and I leverage debt properly. Uh, and you come from a different environment. Yes, we, we already, that also helps, we, yeah. We, yes, we already, um, we already have to admit, Ama, we have to accept that the U.S. gave you a better platform to yeah. access affordable debt. Yeah. How can that environment be created in yeah. Kenya? So debt, the reason why I think debt is important, you know, there's this concept, particularly in this country, uh, in that debt is a negative term, okay? Like, we, you know, whether it's a government aspect or everything else. Um, debt is a very important part of a modern economic system, okay? Uh, because that's how you build wealth. You know, in simplicity's sake, you know, this is what Karl Marx and all these people are talking about. It, it doesn't exist, huh? it's just there. You know, this is just paper yeah, money. Yeah. Huh? You know, it's just, it's the, but we trust the system. It's subjective reality. Yeah, it's subjective reality, yeah? It's a very good example of the metaverse, huh? <laughs> you know, it's like yes. we're rich in the metaverse. Yes, you yes, know? yes, uh, yes. Well, there are some people who are like, Mini Konangombe, 1,000. Huh? They are rich, like, you know. Yes, they are rich in cows. <laughs> yeah, yes. they are rich, they're rich in cows. Mm. But even then, it's still based on a trust, okay? You're rich in cows because you can trade that cow for something else, okay? Yeah. Which, whether it be a house or whatever it is that you need, because huh? the cow, even of itself, 
is not valuable. And that's why we move from a butter system to an economic system that is based on monetary policy, because you and I may have different definitions of wealth, but we agree that we're gonna use the Kenya shilling as a standardization because we can trade this. Otherwise, I'm trading your cows for my sheep, but he wants chickens, and then now we have chickens in the mix, and then you know there's all these particular things that becomes very complicated. Mm -hmm. So money helps that, and now when money comes into place, you know the people who figured out the the, the Venetians and uh, uh, some of these Italians were you know really good at, at at the aspect of debt because you can now go and borrow debt um, and utilize it for your growth business, and that's how it all ended up being. Huh? You go it's like okay, nataka kufungwa biashara. Sina cash, what am I gonna do? Na kuja kwako daktari kingore kwa mbiye nene, but ye miyamoja. Ye nini? Na kufungwa biashara. Huh? Then I open the thing. Huh? I have a good business plan, I hope. Okay, I buy something for 100. Good business I sell, plan. Mm -hmm. okay. I get 20 bob, I get 20 bob. Eventually after five, six months, I get the initial 100. It's like, here's your 100 plus 20 bob of interest. I'm left with by now 100 that I've created that is debt free, okay. Then I use that strategically, and now I open the next business or grow the business. Huh? Um, You're going and, back to something Jimmy said. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a chance. The most hopeful thing is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Good, good ideas are important. Um, and I think, you know, in the TikTok society that we live in or Instagram society that we live in is that uh, ideas are fleeting uh, because there's a very big copycat system. Uh, I do things not because they're good for me, but because I saw someone else do it, and I make the assumption that they're good. Think of YouTube, okay? How many YouTube channels do people have? Very okay? many. Very many, okay? How many of those are monetized? Everybody thinks that you can open a YouTube channel and become monetized. So my YouTube channel is monetized. I have almost a million views, okay? How much yes. have I made from it? Probably about $60, okay, mm -hmm. uh, in it. Uh, it's not because, you know, you have to make enough like $100 before YouTube sends you the first check. But how much time and resources and stuff like that have spent? Whereas people think it was like, oh, because nearly on uh, Kingori Mefanyo, I saw Lin Gogi do it, I can start my own particular thing. Yeah. Without necessarily looking at it in terms of the metrics, dynamics, consistency. Better yet, is it a good fit for you? Are you a funny person? Are you, are you a comedian? Are you a journalist? Are you, wh what is it that you're selling? At the basic aspect of it, it's a pure supply and demand aspect. You have something that people want or need and they're willing to come to you for it, be it YouTube, be it your Kibanda, and that's the underlying principle. So it doesn't matter how good something is, it could be a diamond, but if people don't view diamond as valuable, if right now we're in the desert and we have no chance of getting rescued, and I tell you, I can give you a 100 million diamond, or I can give you an unlimited supply of water, but you can never leave this place, okay? With a diamond, we say, we'll give you a diamond, but you also can never live, but we will let you try and hike, you know, <laughs> and, and you're in the middle of the Sahara. Yeah. You know, chances are, most people with good sense would say, you know, give me the unlimited supply of water, at least I can dig for my diamond later, you know, yeah. as opposed to I can't drink the diamond. Um, they're all uh, subjective value systems that we place onto them, whether it is precious metals, whether it is, you know, um, cars or there's a subjective aspect to it. And an economy develops when people agree on what are the common denominators that we're going to assign value to uh, and what are we going to use as a medium of trade. And then, better yet, open that door to make it equal access. Maybe not necessarily uh, equal outcomes, but at the basic minimum, we should have equal access and equal opportunity. We are in an era of information. From this conversation, first of all, I have to uh, say this out loud. I'm a big fan of humanity. And I try as much as possible to go back to try to understand how things are and why they are. And one of the best people I've found that explains uh, some of the ills that um, we have in society some of the problems we have is Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, you may have come across his mm -hmm. content. And it, it, it's tempting to start asking ourselves, we live in a capitalistic system, right? Capitalism, right? Um, if you can survive, get to the top. Um, mm -hmm. We talk about the fewer the better, because when you talk about copycats, it means 
uh, there's a limit to how many people can copy a business yeah. for it to work. Mm -hmm. It's a system of supply and demand, mm -hmm. right? Does it mean that the systems we created for us as human beings are not sustainable, right? Let's say, for example, you mentioned something about comp uh, keeping up uh, with the Joneses, right? Uh, if we go back to the hunter-gatherer society, not to say that we live like that, uh, if we go back to the time that we used to walk naked, it wouldn't matter uh, what clothes you're wearing, uh, we wouldn't matter whether Gucci it's Nini, uh, we'll probably compete on skin, but that would be basically a um, natural lottery, right? The lottery by birth. Does this mean that at one point, if things continue as they are, we will exhaust what we have because you said resources are finite? Yeah, resources are finite, especially if they're non-renewable. Huh? Uh, we, can't, we, can't, yeah. we can't all be rich. We can't all have access to the good life that everybody would wish for. But again, good life is relative. Yeah, good life is, we can't all be rich, but I would venture to say we can all be comfortable, especially if humanity uh, valued its common neighbor. Uh, so for me, I always say, it, it costs me nothing to turn around and say, this is where I cross the river, this is where it's shallowest, this is where the current is not too strong. Uh, because by getting you to this side, you know, we, we're stronger together. You know, there's the saying, a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. Uh, in fact, I go a step further and say, in fact, Lighting more candles brightens the room because there's only yes. so much you can do uh, with one. And I think if we get into a point, and we should, and then thankfully the innate nature of human beings uh, is love. You know, hate, like I like to say, Mandela um, is 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 learnt. Uh, you know, we are we are um, think of um, of an infant or a toddler uh, and their perception of of, uh, of 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 reality in terms of it. Uh, it's very dynamic, and it's usually not um, polluted by biases. Okay, I remember one time. Um, so I grew up in Texas, in Central Texas, you know, and we were the only people of color with uh, Chuck Norris. With Chuck Norris, yeah. So I lived in a small town called Troy, um, and um, my family were the only people of color. And by that I mean we were the only black people. Okay. Uh, and the church we used to go to, there was this uh, young young uh, toddler, um, you know, about, I would say, maybe three or four years old, uh, give or take, could speak, could, you know, hold a conversation. Uh, and she was talking to my sister, uh, and some other gentleman happened to walk by, and the kid asked, oh, is, is that your father? Uh, and Elizabeth looked, expecting to see my father. And it wasn't. It was somebody who couldn't be categorically different from my father. One, my father is black like me. The kid was pointing to a, a white, white person, man. you know, yes. without any differentiation that that cannot be your father because, you know, there's genetically, you know, impossible. Mm. Uh, and that aspect of innocence is lost as, as we grow uh, in terms of biases learned uh, and then, you know, aspect of subconscious aspect. And I think for a lot of us, um, particularly the people who have made it by definition, whatever that definition is, or a duty to society to be stewards of what we have been given in terms of enabling or creating an enabling environment. I may not be able to give everyone a dollar, and in fact, I can't, even if I was Bill Gates, but I can bequeath what I have. Whatever knowledge or talent that I have, I can bequeath that to someone whether it be by mentorship, whether it be actually, you know, pulling someone out and making a difference in their life, we each have a role to play. And I, there's an old Greek proverb that says, society prospers when people plant trees whose shade they will not sit in. And I think that's very important. Uh, when I go back to the very first house that we bought in Texas in, in, in 2001 with my parents, um, we haven't lived in that house since 2012 when it was sold. But the garden and the trees that we planted are there, being enjoyed by other people. We didn't enjoy them because the trees didn't hit maturity even after 12 years. But I happened to drive by there a year and a half ago, and it was just majestic. The whole entire house that I used to complain about how hot it was because there was no shade was just sitting in the shade. And there was someone else who did not know me, who I'd never met, and who I'll never meet because we didn't go and say we used to live there, mm -hmm. who sits there and enjoys that particular benefit. Yes. Uh, and that can be, you know, put into context in multiple other things. Yes. So we put some kids uh, through school 
uh, as a family and as a society and even as a uh, as an uh, organization that that we started and you can't educate everyone we know that because we we're not able to do so as within our capacity but the feeling of making a difference in someone else's life um, especially if you're able to do it blindly which is what I love and by blindly I mean that they don't know and have no way of knowing that I'm the one who did it you know I love that and just aspect of like I made a difference in someone else's life uh, and having that be uh, in of itself lastly you know uh, at least in closing on this particular topic um, there are truths that we can take from many different aspects you know I was born up a Christian I'm clearly a Mocorino um, but you know, my dad is a religious scholar. His PhD is in religion. Uh, so we grew up reading, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, and, you know, just because they were there. Uh, and there's a Suda in the Quran that says, you know, the reward for goodness is goodness. Uh, and that's for me what underlying this aspect is that you do good simply because its reward is good. Yeah. 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 Ah, okay. Okay. Take us to the idea of affording. What does it mean to afford before? Because there's something uh, in our conversation, previous conversation you mentioned that the science of borrowing, there are things that make sense when borrowed short term, three months, six months, but there are things that can only make sense long term. How can you know you can afford either? Yeah. So borrowing short term uh, is an indicator of a larger malaise or a larger disease in your financial health. If you borrow short term, you borrow short term, you have a problem. Yeah. If you borrow short term, uh, especially continuously, okay, one off is because stuff happens. Uh, you may be in between jobs and stuff like that, uh, or you, you know, your kid just graduated and I'm in here university. Yeah, it's yeah. not a thing that happens, you know, regularly. Yeah, so it may have uh, caught you off guard or you are not expecting. Uh, so borrowing short term to pay for school fees is not bad in of itself. Uh, yes, and yes. there's some people who have who have to do that, but Borrowing, for example, uh, if, and I'm talking about extreme poverty, I'm just talking about, you know, the, if, if you're in, you know, uh, the middle class and you live in Kileleshwa or you live in Langata and you're always utilizing your uh, pay advance so that you can pay rent, that's indicative of really huge problems in your financial health. There could be multiple different things. One, you're either living outside your means. Two, the house is, you know, uh, out of your league, out of your league, or out of your reach, uh, and you could be living a very comfortable life if you just downgraded your house or just downgraded your lifestyle. Uh, I was helping a friend of mine, uh, and um, they were like, "Man, I don't know how to save for this down payment. It's just I, I, I try as I may, I can't do it." And I was like, "Okay, do you mind if I, you know, look at your finances?" And they were like, "Yeah, we were a good friends." I was like, "Okay, send me everything." Yeah, so uh, logged in. Went and reviewed their bank accounts, uh, ran the, do this an analysis, and I'm like, okay, hey, buddy, do you know that you spent $1,200 in food last month? Now, this particular person, One month. yeah, was making $10,000 per month. Huh? It's like, do you know that you spent $1,200 in food last month? Um, it's like, there's no possible way you can eat $1,200 worth of food. So it meant that you went to restaurants that were quite expensive, and I asked him. What's your average price for dinner? And he goes, ah, between ninety and fifty dollars, between ninety and one hundred and fifty dollars every day. Yeah, and I was like, and how often do you go? Uh, three, five times a week. Okay, so you do that, and then I was like, oh, I see you have a gym membership, you know, for five hundred dollars uh, per month. How often do you go? Um, and he goes, ah, if I'm lucky, at least once a week. And then I say, oh, I see that you pay for a trainer. Uh, that there's a minimum requirement of two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. How often have you met with them in the last you know, month? They say once. But you still pay them for two hours even though you met them once. Yeah. By the time you've done that, you're getting up to like 3000 5000 And I said, if you were to cut this and just put it in savings, uh, you would have your down payment within four to six months. Um, and uh, now that particular person owns three pieces of property. He's one of my best friends. And we live you know, right next door to each other. We bought houses in, 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 the, same, in the same neighborhood. The other thing is, um, you don't always have to experience everything for you to learn from it. Uh, we're human beings, so we can use compounded knowledge. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to buy something so that I can know whether it's good or bad. 
I can utilize the resources and research and actually find out whether that is good or bad and make a decision based from it. So in terms of what this means, hiring a car before you buy it? Well, so yeah, if I would say that, if, 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 uh, especially if you don't know much about cars, uh, it would be good to, 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 to buy a car. Yeah. My, my, my father-in-law buys uh, uh, cars sight unseen, but it's because he believes in manufacturer, and I do. Uh, so you go to, you know, uh, Mercedes-Benz or BMW or, or, or Toyota. You buy and, from and, there. And, 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 no, no, no. You, 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 you know the specs. Uh, you know what, what, what the car is. And so and it's an area that you work in. And so That's you're like, okay. a whole new level. You're buying a car like a phone. You read the features. Mm -hmm. You buy. I mean, in this day and age, at least for, more, for me, okay, there's so much. I don't need to experience or try something. Uh, I can... Now, it... The assumption here is that what you're reading is factual, <laughs> okay? If it's not factual, then we have a problem. So this particular phone, I can go and read the specs, okay? Uh, 512 GB storage, da 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 This is the new Android, da 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 I was like, okay, check, okay? I trust mm -hmm. the manufacturer, Samsung, huh? They said that this is what it has and it's, it's what I need, or maybe not necessarily need it. I go and get it. Uh, same thing for a laptop. Uh, you, yeah. you, you go and you know the specs and then you read it. Now, assuming that's factual. If it's not in some industries or in some economies, then it becomes a, a problem. Property, for example, uh, in, 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 in Kenya. Okay? Um, I can't take the broker's statements as factual. Okay? I have to go touch. And even when I touch, I'm like, are you sure uko akuna shida maji? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, They're like, yeah. no, we have sunk a borehole. How deep? Mm, 200 mm. meters. But you don't know. You didn't take a thing to go measure. Our trust you, currency is so low. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it cripples a lot of things because what you have is uh, something in economics that we call information asymmetry. Uh, and because you have information asymmetry, it takes a lot longer to make a decision. Or I don't make a decision at all because the, to find out whether this decision is good or for me to find all the answers just takes too much time. And so you end up in a society or in an economy that you know, has um, you know, just some minor things that what they do is they cause friction. Okay? Let me put it for example. I went to China Square yesterday and I bought a table. When it was arrived at home, I realized it had a scratch. Yeah. If I was in the US, what do I do? I return the table. I tell them, in fact, I don't return. I call them, come pick up your table, it has a scratch. In this particular case, they told me, well, you should have looked. It's like it wasn't there <laughs> yeah, when yeah. I got it. Yes, yes, yes. On top of it, it is new and packaged. How, why, why do I need to look? Mm -hmm. You told me it's selling me a new item. Why would I assume that it is damaged? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then I went to buy bulbs. And they have all these things where you have to test the bulb. Huh? And for me, this is, you know, complete fallacy. It's like, why do I need to, to test, test whether the bulb is working is if your you're job. selling me a new bulb? Okay, the bulb says it's new. It's in a box that has never been unwrapped before, why do I need to test it? Two, you're right, it is your job to verify that this bulb works. So if I get home and none of my bulbs work, I should be able to bring them back and you have an issue with your supplier and you deal with it. Otherwise, don't be in this business. But we have this issue where the trust currency is so low uh, and so you have to like, you know, uh, you know, um, Theodore Roosevelt used to say, you know, uh, trust but verify, <laughs> you know. Well, for me, it's a very weird concept. So if you're going to trust, mm -hmm. then why do I need to verify? Interesting, interesting. What is it about uh, um, money that makes you thank God you're not poor? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have been poor, so I know what it is to be poor. I'm mm -hmm. cash poor right now, which is very different from being poor. Okay, Cash poor? <laughs> yeah, cash poor means that just... You could be a millionaire, but yeah. you don't have cash. Yeah, uh, and which for uh, some of us, that, that is normal. I mean, I'm uh, Bezos. Uh, Bezos uh, last week sold about $2 billion worth of Amazon stock. Yeah. Uh, he was not, he, he was cashless technically, you know, yeah, but he needed the cash. And so he sold the stock, but he has easy access to it. Uh, so he has something that he can convert to. to That's that. a very interesting concept. Like there's a level of money that you get to that e pesa e makaratasi does not matter. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean it's I mean I'm like let's see let's see how much I have in my wallet, huh? <laughs> really? Yeah. Let's see how much I have. Okay, and I'm pretty sure I have nothing. 
<laughs> so, ah. driver's license, another driver's license. Don't ask me why I have two. <laughs> One for each car. <laughs> and uh, business cards, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, this is my wife's. Uh, oh, this is our bank, by the way, Wire. Uh, oh, what? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh -huh. so we are a digital bank in, in the US. Uh, but yeah, no cash. All plastics. But this could be 40 million right here. Not necessarily. What I'm saying is that you get to a point where, um, at least as you were mentioning, you know, where the, and it actually can create quite a big problem because you assume as, as a society grows, the less you need of physical, physical currency. Yeah? Yes, yes, because yes. this becomes safe and also this becomes trackable and this is how people build wealth. So when I go to my bank and I tell, you know, Chase, by the way, I should flip all this. I'm sure some people have already zoomed in on the numbers. But you get to a point where if I want a, a, um, you know, a, a line of credit from, from, from Chase, you know, they just need to look at my spending patterns. Or better yet, Chase just asks me to link my other bank account. And they can, you know, uh, do a probability model on what my cash reserves are or my ability to pay. Uh, and so you end up having to a situation where you really don't need liquid cash. And to be fair, actually, and you mentioned that, only one of this is liquid cash. Okay. All this, these are just debt. Credit cards. Yeah, this is just pure credit cards. I never buy anything with this. This is just here in case I need to go to an ATM and I physically need cash. You physically need cash. Yeah. And that's the only reason why I have all these other ones, whether I'm buying, you know, my dinner at Java or whatever, I use a credit card for a few reasons. One, it helps me manage my money because I can see, because I pay off my credit card in month in full every month. So I'm able to see, oh, this month I spent more than one because I'm paying just one bill, you know. Uh, two, why in the world would I use my money when I can use someone else's money? And then I can stretch my money to be doing other things, okay? So okay. these guys have given me a 90 day that I can tap do whatever into. you want. Yeah, as long as I pay them back. So in that 90 days, if you know, Hempton calls me and an EMBA, by the way, no, no, prices are coffee, the Mepanda, maybe do you want to buy a bail? And we send it off. I was like, where do we want to send it off? Dubai, sure. How much is it? Buy it, sell it. You know, two months you have your cash, you pay the bank, and you've made some. Huh? So, that's the beauty so of lim the limit on these other cards, uh, the credit cards, depends on your spending power. Yeah. So the li uh, you know, I I don't want to sound braggadocious uh, because I really am not. No, please I, sound and, braggadocious. <laughs> no, no, I please don't sound braggadocious I, I, because I also start to go and get up and go and get up. Go and get up. Go and get up. Plastic. Go, go, going down. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it. So okay, I don't just use cash so I can spend other people's money. I use cash because it's safe. So if you steal this card today and you take it from me and you go spend it there, I'm not liable for any of that spending. If you take money from my bank account, you have taken money from my bank account, it's gone. Huh? And that's why I personally use credit cards. Other people may have a problem in terms of access to credit cards or also the ability, they use it as, oh, because Babu Nime a limit of 30,000, okay? So, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> no, it goes out, it goes out, it goes out. So, what, what, I was, what I was gonna say is that yes. if, if you look at this, let me, so let me just, let's have a frank conversation. So yes. this card mm -hmm. has a $30,000 limit. That is, that uh, yeah. $30,000, yeah. if you convert, that's like 50 million Kenya shillings. Yeah, so and then about. this card has an $84,000 limit, okay? So I can go today and swipe $84,000 in one transaction, okay? It doesn't mean that I would do it, but the bank- You so, can swipe a V8. Yeah. So, and that's what I say. So, when I, when I buy my transactions, whether it's a car, unless it's a house, huh? yes. I, buy them in, I, I buy them in a credit card. But I didn't start off at 84000 okay? This is a 15-year journey. My first credit card was $250. Okay. okay? That's, the bank, will, they sat down, like an MBA, you, you can only afford 250000 I mean, $250. And then over utilizing that aspect. 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. They see this guy always pays. He has never missed. So what they do is you get what's called an automatic credit increase and they okay. continue to increase. And unfortunately, as you grow in wealth, uh, your spending grows. For me, not in raw dollar terms, but in percentage. I try to keep my percentages the same, you know? Uh, so my business development uh, comes from that. And so that's where you leverage and use debt. 
for your businesses. So my company, when we were like, we need to raise capital, that's what I use my credit card for. Like, how much do we need? Okay, you Renzo Nipatia, 50,000. You Hemstone, give me 50,000. We raised 500,000 in dollars, not from money that we had in the bank, but from money that we had in credit. And then we used that and we built wire from 500,000 to what it is at 18 and a half million today. Right? Still by leveraging debt and growth, where we are now at the point where we can be like, okay, we're gonna bring on investors. We are focused on, uh, on, uh, on, on this you know, financial access for people and individuals living and working outside their home countries. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to your question, it's like, how do you know what's a good business? For me, my definition is very simple. Is there a supply and demand aspect to it? That's first check off. Two, for me, does it have a common good tied to it? And for me, I believe those are the best businesses, businesses that are there to uplift other people. So yeah. we realize that I may have access to this, but it took very hard to get there as a person of color. Can I make that path easier for someone else? Because I know what it was like to be poor and what it was like to be a college student and not have a credit card, but also need the credit card to buy books because even though I was getting paid, I was not getting paid enough this month to buy all the books, but over two months, I can pay back the credit card. And that's why it happened. So this one just, it reaches the future David and brings his spending power here to use now. And if you use that responsibly, you can really, really grow your wealth. So as I close this particular topic, I can ask you, Someone call Frank. Frank makes a hundred thousand per year U.S. dollars. What can you do with a hundred thousand U.S. dollars? Yeah, you can. You can't buy a house in some places. You can, but you can't buy an, a, a house to live in. Um, so for most people, they would need maybe five hundred or six hundred thousand to buy a comfortable house in the U.S. But how do you do that if you're paying it all in cash? Okay. So if you're being paid a hundred thousand a year, it means you have to save for five years in order to pay for that. And you're saving 100% of your income. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. So yeah, impossible yeah. to do. But then okay? the prices will have the changed. The prices will have changed. So by the time you get to five years plus compounded interest, I mean compo uh, uh, compounded inflation, that 500 is now 600, okay? Now, debt allows Frank now to buy a house because he borrows from Frank of year one, Frank of year two, Frank of year three, Frank of year four, and he brings all that spending power now. So okay. you're bringing your future spending power here, and then now that spending power, the bank sees, oh, your spending power is 500,000. So you don't have 500,000, but we know you can pay us 500,000 mm -hmm. over 10 years. Okay. Now, if you have good interest rates, then the system works very well. If you have unaffordable interest rates, then it doesn't. Ah, yeah. And we have unaffordable interest yes. rates. Uh, our next conversation, I believe, um, is budgeting. You are a budgeting expert. Yeah. We'll get down into that. Please, uh, before we let you go, please explain to us how you deal uh, with, with with money talking to you. Like most most people get stuck because we can't get past that period. As in, how do you sleep with your pocket and you know you can swipe a V8? How? How do you sleep in your pocket knowing you can go to Malibu in the morning and eat lunch and yeah. come back? How do you deal with that human side yeah. of money whispering bad things to you? Yeah, it's, it has to be, it's like a demon that you always have to, you know, uh, choke every day. I, not just money. Uh, you know, St. Paul uh, uh, say, says, I must die daily because yeah? the flesh is always, my, my spirit is willing, but my body is weak, uh, is what St. Paul says. Um, he also says, uh, do not use your freedom as an excuse to do anything, because if you do, then where will your sense of freedom B. So yes, I can sense of freedom. Yeah. There's there's freedom in what you can do and the idea of you can do. Yeah. And that's the thing where people fail. Okay. There is I can do. Okay. Yes, I can swipe a V8. Okay. But I have to pay it back. Okay, because it's it's still not my money. Okay. So, so wealth is the feeling of I can do. Yes, yeah, I can do. I can do. But I'll not do it. Yeah. yeah I, I like St. Paul again because another part he says is that not everything is prohibited, but not everything is expedient. Okay. So not everything is sinful or, un, or, 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 or uh, unlawful, but not everything is expedient. And what he means there is that just because something is categorically a jandikwa do not do, doesn't mean 
that it is expedient. And expedient just means it is good for you. So you can do something, and the underlying question you have to ask for yourself, is it good for you? And this is, this is what I used to do. I used something uh, that I termed longevity of thought, which for me means how long have I been thinking about that action, that doing? Is it momentary? Is it impulsive? If it's impulsive, I really, I just don't make decisions on impulse, okay? If I have been thinking about something, it means I've been articulating it and I've been planning it. And the longer I've been thinking about it, the longer I've been planning it. So if I want a V8, for example, I will plan to get one. I will, you know, work things around uh, because Everything is a lever, so you, there's, there's just this, this is money, huh? it's a glass, huh? Every, everybody has. Uh, your glass may be different from mine, but at least everyone has a glass. Huh? And I can pour some of it, and that goes to a V8, but I can't get it back. I can pour this other one, and that goes to a five-bedroom house, or I can pour a little bit less, and it goes to a three-bedroom house, okay? I can pour this, I can pour this, you know, I can spend all my evenings at social house, mm. okay? And that's still pouring in. Um, and... That's the underlying factor. Okay. Um, just because you have the ability to do something doesn't mean you should do it. The pleasure is in the, I know I can do it, but yeah. I will not. Yeah. The, the power is in... Self-control. Delayed gratification. <laughs> Dr. David Washira, our Asante Sana, first of all, for making time for us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Our director, Wiki, um, I believe, uh, is calling our shot. Okay. Uh, we have like two minutes. Yakufunga. Yes, two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Sawa. Yeah. Please say it. No, I, I was talking about uh, ability. Just because you have the ability to do something doesn't mean you should do it. Um, uh, you should have strong considerations about how your actions rob you uh, of your future. And so what I ask, what I tell young people, what I tell others is like, do not let momentary choices have long-lasting impact. impact. Negative. Yeah, particularly negative. Okay. Okay. Um, and when it comes to money, unfortunately for a lot of people, momentary pleasures related to money have a long-lasting impact. And you rob yourself of, you know, gratified pleasure, if you want to use that word, or, uh, or more happiness or joy, uh, by simply, you know, doing something momentary right now um, that robs me from doing something, you know, continuously. Let me mm -hmm. put it in, in, in more layman's terms. No one likes going through security, okay? But when I get into a flight, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder whether we're going to arrive in destination. So I'm willing to give up short-term freedom so that I can continue to have my long-term freedom. Otherwise, it was like, yeah, everybody entered as you are. Okay, we may not get to the destination. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hey, nicely put, nicely put. Mazia Sante Sana for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you it's for pleasure. making time for us. Well, we are booking you in advance for a conversation on budgeting before you go back to the US. Oh, I, I would love to. B budgeting is something that, uh, and, and we can talk about it both at the personal level and at the government level. <laughs> Thank you well. very much. <laughs> Mazia Sante Sana for sticking with us up to this point. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our content. Uh, who do you want to see next? We already have very, very good vibes lined up for you. But if there's anyone else who wants to share your story, anyone else who wants to share your story, please give us your feedback in the comment section. If there's anywhere else who wants to improve, give us your feedback. To not check it, to Korada, uh, so that we can make this better, a better experience for you. This has to be time well wasted. Otherwise, I'm Dr. Kingori. See you on the next one.